Good evening, everyone. It's so wonderful for Jyotish and me to be back here in Chennai. Last year when we were here, as you remember, many of you were here, we dedicated the new center, and it was just so much day after day, night after night, everyone uh, helping to get everything ready for the dedication. And now a year has gone by, and everything is more settled. You have curtains. <laughs> <laughs> but more than that, you can feel now it has a Nanda's vibration and the many hours of meditation here. And um, we just want to, we're, we're going to be sharing tonight. You know, Jatish uh, was one of the first people to meet Swamiji. And, 1967, and I met him two years later in 1969, and we'll be sharing a little bit about our experiences, please come, uh, with Swamiji, but it would be (coughs) remiss if we did not say uh, that the, the Sangha in Chennai has a special place, uh, in our hearts, and I think that means maybe in all of Ananda because of your kindness and your friendship and your sweetness and uh, constantly staying connected with us. So we thank you for that. And uh, there are people that we have met over the course of our, our, our months here in India this year. <laughs> it's all right. We... we uh, <laughs> We told when we were giving a lecture in Italy, people's phones kept going off, and we said, we are not asking you to turn off your mobiles, but anyone whose phone goes off, it, your number will be given to the largest telemarketing company in America, <laughs> in Italy. <laughs> so you can expect to get a lot of calls. So people turned off their phones. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, we're just very happy to be here. And, you know, we will go back to America. Uh, on We fly back next Tuesday night. And not everyone is aware of this, but we're going back early this year because Ananda is has been given, and Jatish and I will be the representatives to receive it, 
an award from the United Nations for upliftment of consciousness. So it's really, it, it's not, you know, it's, it's, they are receiving the award for what they have done to uplift world consciousness, but they don't have hands to receive it yet, so we will do that. But it's, it's a very important moment for Master's work. So anyway, that's about all I have to say, and She'll talk later. <laughs> so unfortunately, we have an, another engagement this evening, and so we'll have to uh, end at 8 o'clock. But tomorrow evening we will also be giving a program here, and then we don't have anything afterwards, so we can linger and and share more time together. Tonight we wanted to talk a little bit about what it was like to live with Swami Kriyananda, because it was quite an experience. Um, I met him on Easter Sunday in 1967. That was April 21st that year. And some of you have heard this story, but uh, I had read a few months earlier, I had read Autobiography of a Yogi, and it really changed my life. But I didn't know what to do beyond that because it wasn't obvious, at least from the book, that there was an organization or lessons or any of that. So I ended up uh, a few months later, I my brother-in-law had also read it, and he found out the name and address of a direct disciple of Yoganandaji's. And so we went one on Sunday afternoon about 1 o'clock. We went, and he had a little apartment in San Francisco, not even as big as the downstairs of this place or close to that size at any rate, but not bigger. And we just knocked on his uh, door, and he introduced himself, and we introduced himself ourselves. And he said, I'm working on a project. Would you like to help? And we said, yes, yes, of course. And he was sending out a mailing for his uh, upcoming classes. But I've often joked that I agreed to work on a project. I just didn't know that it was going to take 50 years uh, to to have not even yet the completion of that project. So later on I realized that he was working on a project and you're looking at the project. It was It was me that he was working on as well as hundreds and thousands of other people. Um, it became very clear right away some of the basic qualities of Swamiji. One, that project, even on Easter Sunday, he was constantly in motion. Not that he was always working, but he was always doing something that was, I can't say it was always active, because sometimes he could be very still, he could be sitting, and you would watch him. And most people, when they sit, they fidget. You know, they tap their foot or they move around. He would be very still. His eyes were very still. And he didn't blink a lot, so he would look. And he had a lot of intensity in him. So if he looked at you, you knew that he was looking at you. It wasn't wasn't something that was uh, casual. He was extremely intelligent. He, he, in all ways, you know, intelligent people, they show that in sometimes the quickness with which they perceive what's going on, the quickness with which they understand what you're saying, and catch a joke, for instance, uh, whatever it is. He was just very, very present and very intelligent. Speaking of his being present, it was different from most people because most people, you have the, <coughs> the impression that their mind is a little bit scattered, 
They might be talking to you or they might be listening to you, but you look and in the eyes are the sense that they're not really here. They're thinking of something else. Swami wasn't like that at all. He was laser-like in his focus. So he always focused on whatever he was doing at that time. I remember one time we were with him, and he was so often when we were with him, he was editing. Because when you write 150 books, which is what he did, he would write the book. And let me tell you his formula, not formula, his method for writing it. Because some of you, this is this is good information. Some of you may be writers, or even if you're not writers, it helps to clarify. So first he said, you have to get the ideas down. And you have to, when you have an inspiration, you have to hold that inspiration strongly and don't let it drop. And in that inspiration, there's a flow of energy. And in that flow of energy, you get the ideas down. And it doesn't matter at that point very much how elegantly you get them down. They might even just be shorthand or just be a word or two that will later become a chapter. But you get those ideas down. Then he said the next stage is you go through and you clarify those ideas. And so he loved, one of the things he very, very much enjoyed was when he would come up with a new way to explain something to people. One of the examples he used occasionally was um, people asked him, how can something seem to be solid and it not and it's not solid? You know, how can the atoms, the, our bodies... Apparently, what I've read scientifically is if you take the atom, if the if the core of the atom, the nucleus of the atom, is the size of a soccer ball, the electron field going around that is at the far edge of that soccer stadium. And everything else is space, even inside the atom. And so how can all of that space seem to be solid. And then he real, he came up with the example that if you look at an a airplane and the propeller of an airplane, that uh, you just see, let's say, a propeller like this, a, a fan blade, and if you see the three blades, there's it's obvious that there's a lot of space in between them. But if those blades are in motion... It can seem like it's solid. If this was spinning fast enough and we looked at it, it would seem as if there was a solid circle there. And so he he loved, he was excited when he came up with that example of how to explain an esoteric truth. Because one of the main things that it was his dharma to do was to take complicated or subtle truths, and explain them so simply that you could understand them immediately. And so the second stage of his writing was to take those that flow of ideas, those ideas, and then clarify them, and then make sure that, that you understood. So in the editing process, he would say, I challenge every word that I've written because he said too many authors, if you read their works, they don't really understand what they're trying to say, and therefore they make it obscure. And the tendency of people is to say, oh, it must be very intelligent because I can't understand a word of it. Well, unfortunately, the author doesn't understand more than a couple of words of it either. And so they make it seem complicated or seem obscure. Swami, who had a wonderful sense of humor, said, get a book like that and put it beside your bed, and then if you have trouble sleeping, it's much better than a sleeping pill. Just read a paragraph of one of those books, and it'll put you to sleep right away. But he would, he would 
with deep, deep concentration. He would work until he knew that not only was he understanding what he was saying, but he was explaining it in a way that the reader could understand. So clarity was the next thing. Then he said, it isn't enough just to have clarity. You have to have the magnetism in that clarity that makes a person want to read it and open up to it. So then he would go through and he would, it, it isn't just, it's a variety of ways that he would put magnetism into it. Sometimes it would be a story that touched your heart. So there would be the concept that was mental and a story that touched your heart. And having both of those together in one concept made it magnetic. You wanted to read that. You wanted to accept it. And then finally he would go through and his final editing was sometimes, I mean, he, he would edit a, a book. So he would type it out and then he would edit and it was in manuscript form. And sometimes he would make so many changes on a page, you could barely see the typeface anymore. And he would go through and gradually those changes would get less and less and less. And toward the end, he was working on kind of poetry and magnetism together. So not just magnetic, but also beautiful in its own way. And he would say, for instance, end the sentence with a word that is um, gives a punctuation to it. I don't know if I can quickly think of an example, but... Um, it might be something like uh, the sun rose in the morning and then in the evening it set with a beautiful uh, coloration. Well, coloration isn't a very strong word, and it's a little bit of a confusing word. And so he would rearrange that. The sun rose in the evening, and then the coloration at the time that it was going down made it seem as if it put a period on the day. And then, bang, you'd you'd know kind of poetically that that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so all of this is to talk about his kind of laser-like focus. When he was editing, um, he he was completely focused on on what he was doing and you couldn't uh, get his attention until he was finished so that laser like focus and high high intelligence combined with creativity because he said that his creativity was so powerful within him he said ideas flowed like a volcano that they just erupted and they they would come with force, they would come with a lot of energy. And he said, I couldn't not be creative. It was just part of my nature. On the other hand, he didn't need to do anything kind of for his own completion. Somebody once, uh, because he also wrote 450 pieces of music, somebody said, oh, I just have to write music. And Swami said, I don't have to write music. I like to write music. I feel that it's a good thing to do. I do it as service to my guru, but I don't feel like I have to write it in order to complete myself. It was more just constantly thinking of how he could serve his guru and how he could serve others. He had a great sense of humor Many of you have heard his P.G. Woodhouse readings. And he would laugh and laugh, and the whole room would laugh with him. And he would sometimes, he loved to hear a a joke. So Davy and I, one of our little uh, sidelines, I don't know, it was kind of like a hobby 
was to find jokes that we could tell Swami because he was always eager to hear a nice, good, funny joke. And so when he'd hear it, he would laugh, and he had this enormous laughter filled with joy, a beautiful, beautiful sense of humor. But along with that beautiful sense of humor was a kind of a joyful spirit that infused joy and uplifted consciousness in everything that he did. He was a king in his past lives. He was uh, he was quite sure, as many of you may have read the book, uh, Two Souls, Four Lives, that he was King Henry of England, and that was William's son. Then he was also a son of... Uh, William, I, I should say, was master in a previous incarnation. Uh, William the Conqueror of England. And Swami said that it was a shock because he came up in the English school system. And in that school system, William the Conqueror was considered one of history's great villains because he came and conquered England. And then Swami said it was a great shock to find out that was my own guru. Um, nonetheless, he, it's, he, was, he had a past association with Master, but he had a past association in such a way that it was a relationship where he came after Master and continued the mission that Master was trying to do, but didn't go beyond the territory that Master was doing. So in the case of of England and Normandy, he could, uh, as, as uh, King Henry, he could have conquered a lot more territory, but he didn't. He just conquered and made peaceful that territory that Master came in order to make peaceful. And it was one of the longest periods of peace in medieval that medieval area era uh, thirty years of peace that that Henry had, but there were so many many aspects to Swami's nature. I said he had been a king in the past life because he had a certain nobility about him that was just natural. It wasn't as if he put on airs of any kind whatsoever. In fact, it was quite the opposite. He pretended to be less than what he actually was so that he didn't intimidate people. And But there was always a sense of nobility and uplifted consciousness. And for the group of people that came at the beginning of Ananda, he uplifted all of our consciousness. He would take us to restaurants that were uh, nicer than what most of us had ever been in, just in order to make us break the thought that, oh, I don't belong here. It was, you belong anywhere, anywhere that God puts you. And so he was always working to uplift our consciousness. Then I'll just end with the thought that for himself and what he also demonstrated was that his main self-definition was not as a writer, not as a creator, not as a songwriter, not as a singer, not none of that. His self-definition was as a disciple of Master. And that's, that's how he lived his life. And so everything, there was always a sense of reverence and a sense of attunement with Master, and his mind would dwell always on Master, I think. One time, Davy and I were walking with him in the garden. Uh, he had he, That's another aspect. He loved beauty and created beauty all around him, always. So he had a beautiful garden, and he, we would, he would take exercise toward the end of his life by walking around. And one time we were with him, and he just stopped and he said, oh, that's what he meant. And we said, what, what are you meaning, Swami? He said, I was remembering 
a time when I was with Master, and he seemed to be talking to someone else. But as he was talking, he just raised his eyebrow and glanced in my direction. Now I realize, this was 60 years later, now I realize that what he was saying to that other person, he was actually saying to me. But he didn't want to say it directly to me. He wanted me to catch it. And so here now, 60 years later, oh, that's what he meant. See, his mind was constantly there with his guru. But such a great, great soul. It was a privilege and a joy to be with him and be in his presence. So I'll just speak a little bit, and then maybe we'll have time for some questions. That's, I know we always have good questions from this group. One of the gifts that Swami gave anyone around him who was receptive was the way he related to you and what he tried to bring out of you were the proper attitudes that we need to find God. So he didn't, I mean, he he didn't care about people's personalities, if they were young, old, pleasant, unpleasant. He really just related to everyone according to their spiritual sincerity. And people could be very accomplished and uh, status in the world and so forth, But if they weren't really spiritually sincere, he was polite and gracious to everyone, but he wouldn't really work with them on the same way he worked with those of us who really came for him to bring us towards God. And he it wasn't easy. It wasn't like he just said, oh, the path to God is so sweet and pleasant. He was working, he was ironing out the kinks in our ego, all the wrinkles, and that's not pleasant. We were recently talking with a young man who's part of Ananda, and he's being asked to take up a certain uh, area of service. And he talked with us, and he said, I don't want to do that. That's going to be really hard for me. And we said, well, what do you think the spiritual path is? Do you think it's just doing what's easy and pleasant? And we said, if you back away from this, you will diminish spiritually. And I hope he can rise to the occasion. But we need to, Swami was always challenging our resistances. Wherever there was a resistance, that's what he would ask you to do. We were saying to Dharmarajan and Dharmini, uh, if there was a choice of A or B, and you were saying, oh, please, don't let it be B, he would say, oh, how would you like to do B? You knew it was coming. <laughs> you knew you couldn't avoid it. And if you said no, he wouldn't get mad. He wouldn't say, oh, you know, that was a bad choice. He would just say, all right, you play out, do it the way you want to do it, but when you're ready to take up the the real discipline, then come back. And so in our Swami isn't here anymore. But in his physical body, he's very present. People ask us if we miss him. On a certain level, yes, but mainly I don't we don't miss him because he's so present all the time, guiding our thoughts. Uh, we had a decision to make recently about some aspect of the work. And we felt Swami's joy and blessing so strongly, we knew it was the right thing to do. But in our own lives as disciples, as spiritual seekers, look at all the circumstances in your life. None of it is random. None of it is by chance. If there are people at work, in your family, where neighbors that are difficult for you to relate to, that's not by chance. God put them there, and he put you there, exactly. That's what we saw Swami doing all the time. He, I can't tell you how the number of people that 
really didn't get along at all. And he'd say, okay, you two work together then on this project. <laughs> Do it again and again till people figured it out. Oh, I need to be divine friends with everyone. If they're nice, if they're not nice. If something... A certain project, I just think I don't want to do it, I don't like to do it, then you think, well, that's probably what I should be doing for my own growth because it's all about breaking down the resistances of the ego. And after a while, you you start understanding what the game is and you say, okay, I get it. Wherever I feel a resistance, that's where I need to go because that's diminishing the ego And Swami would just lovingly, gently always push us past what we thought our limitations were. And then when you walk past that wall, that inner barrier, what happens? Freedom. You think, oh, I could do that. I'm not a weakling. I'm not somebody who's afraid of challenges. And then the next challenge comes and the next until you don't need to be tested anymore. That day will come. But Swami was working with all of us in that way. He um, he was asking uh, two people, well, I'll say it was Jaya and Sadna Devi, who uh, many of you know, at this time, they were living at Ananda Village, and he asked them if they we were starting a work on the east coast of America in Rhode Island. And he asked Jai, he said, would you be interested in going? And Jai said, oh, yes, of course, Swami. And then he called Sadhana Devi over, who's more of a shy person. And he said, I'm not asking you if you want to go. I'm asking you if you will go. And and what could she say to that? And and that's a good distinction in your own life. See, these are principles. It's not personal. It wasn't unique to Swamiji. I'm sure it was how Master trained his disciples. And we are disciples of a great Master. So the principle is not what you want, but what is right. And if you can always make that distinction, sometimes what you want and what you write and what is right are the same. But not always. And then you have to do what's right. And that's the path of discipleship. Also, he never let us, another aspect of the path to God, and remember in uh, the chapter uh, in Autobiography, Babaji, Yogi Christ of India, the very last part is Lahiri Mahasha is um, at Akumba Mela, and he's sort of being critical of hypocritical sadhus. And then he looks, and there's Babaji. And he goes, Master, what are you doing here? And he said, I am washing the feet of this sadhu, thereby uh, expressing the attitude that is most pleasing to God, humility. And that's how that chapter ended. And But the quality of humility, Swami lived it, and the people that he felt the most comfortable with. That isn't right to say. He was trying to train all of us in that attitude. No matter what role we had, if it was big, if it was little, he didn't treat anyone differently. But he wanted us all to realize that before God, no human accomplishment makes any difference. How could it? It's so little anything we could possibly do in this world. But just that humility, overcoming resistances, and then a childlike joy in everything. Because, Master, remember those of you who saw the movie The Answer, we showed it in Coimbatore the other day, uh, last Saturday. Uh, Master kept saying to Swami, be, you're too serious. Become more childlike, more childlike. And Swami was one of the, the first, um, I don't know, moments where I had any personal interaction with him, and it was very uh, surprising what happened. He invited a whole group of people, about 25 of us, to go uh, to the nearby town and see a movie. This happened to be a Walt Disney movie called Swiss Family Robinson. And I was new to Ananda, and I couldn't figure out, here's this great yogi, 
and he's going to go see Swiss Family Robinson, this dumb Walt Disney movie. <laughs> and, and so we were all filling into the theater. And as it just happened that the seat next to Swami was empty, and so he motioned, and I sat down. And I said to him, uh, Swami, do you think you'll like this movie? And he said, he just got this beautiful childlike smile, and he said, Oh, yes, I've seen it seven times. <laughs> and and I just was so shocked. I just thought, how could that be? But then I kept looking over at him during the movie, and he was just so, just like uh, uh, the heart of a child, and that's what Master trained him to become that way. Just simplicity, humility, not judging with his mind, that's a silly scene, or whatever it might be. He just was with that openness of a child, and that's whenever whenever you were with him, life just was so sweet and so fun, and uh, it just, nothing... It, also, if you remember in the movie, uh, The Answer, which will be released for everybody to see early next year, sometime in the spring of next year, when he was a little boy, Swami said to his mother, I don't want to grow up, Mother. Grown-ups have to take everything so seriously. And, I mean, even from a child that he had that quality, and the Master brought it out more. But the path to God is... We have to be, that Jesus Christ said, suffer little, and Master said it to Swamiji, suffer little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Meaning, let these, you know, the children were clamoring to be around uh, the yogi Jesus, and, and the disciples were saying, oh, no, no, this must be serious. And, and he said, let the little children come to me, because of such is the kingdom of heaven. So, it's a beautiful balance that he, Swamiji tried to imbue in us. On the one hand, having the courage and the strength of a warrior. On the other hand, having no sense of any self-importance. And then finally, just to have that inner freedom of a child. And when you can bring all those things together that's when the guru can really start working with you. Because, again, remember Master says, Swami speaks of it often in his autobiography, attunement, attunement, get in tune. Master said to some of the disciples, some of you will fall off the path, but it needn't be if you stay in tune. And he also said, People were asking him at the end of his life, some of the monks, will I find God? Will I find God? And he said, all of you will, if you stay in tune. And so the attunement with these qualities, and for Jyotish and for me, I know Dharmarajan and Dharmini, they came a little bit later, but the imprint of Swami on all of our souls, it really, it's the most important thing that happened in our life, really. I say that without any question. I, If I had not met Swamiji, I had read autobiography. I was learning how to meditate. But I know I, he changed my karma so that I, would not, that I would stay on the path as the highest priority in my life. He saw for all of us. He saw we had that potential, but he pushed away everything that would have deterred us, and he just created a path for us to find God. And But don't feel that you all are left out because that process still goes on if we stay in tune, if we ask Master Swami, guide me to God, and then hold on to your hats because it's, a, it's an interesting ride, but it's a wonderful, wonderful journey a journey of freedom and joy and love and adventures that you never thought you would have. But uh, we're very, very, very blessed to be in the orbit of such a great soul as Swami and, of course, bringing us to the feet of our Guru Master. So 
Do you have any questions, Shatish? <laughs> You know, I just want to add one thought, and then we'll uh, see if you have any questions. But we shouldn't get mesmerized because it isn't the personality of Swami that was important, or even, to a certain extent, his physical presence. Because, yes, there was a certain magnetism of being in his physical presence, but it wasn't the personality, it was the values and the attitudes and the energy. It was the intangible things that were being expressed through that personality. And Davy and I probably, you know, we knew him for 50 years. I doubt that we had five counseling sessions with him in all that time. Mainly, he would teach us by through lectures, which all of you have available to you. All of those have been recorded. That's mainly how he taught. And just being around in different circumstances and seeing how the attitudes and the behavior of an uplifted soul. But it wasn't as if all of you are have missed it out completely because he isn't around anymore. None of us knew Master, and yet our whole life has been dedicated to Master. And so most of you haven't had a chance to meet Swamiji, but nonetheless his teachings, his attitudes, his books, his music, his voice, all of those things are available. And if you want to be in tune with him, listen to his music, Read his books, listen to his lectures. Sing his music. Sing his music, even better. Okay, so questions if you have any. So I have to be in tune with Master throughout the day. I mean, sometimes at work I used to myself that uh, he's there and I, with any issues that is coming up, I don't realize. Then I get into moods or everything. But I have to practice or anything. So I, it was a little hard to understand. Can you uh, how to be in tune with Master during the day? He'll get in moods and things okay. like that. Okay, so how to be in, ma in tune with Master during the day? Well, don't have your expectations set to unrealistic levels. If you expect perfection, then you, you you'll feel disappointed. Try to remember Master a number of times during the day. And in that remembrance, tune in to him. But don't feel, oh, I haven't thought of Master for the last two hours. Uh, I must be a terrible disciple. Um, it's just as you can. It's more, I would say, it's less to Master than trying to feel that Master is working through you. So if you get into a mood, try to catch the fact that you're in a mood. And then you'll feel, as soon as you catch the fact that you're in a mood, if you, if you don't become aware of the fact that you're in a mood, then you're just in a mood and you're unconscious. But become aware, kind of uh, mindful of the fact that now I'm having a mood. As soon as you can say, now I'm having a mood, you're halfway out of that mood. It's the entrapment and in in being entranced and stuck in that mood that keeps you there. So try to be a little bit mindful as if Master is with you and you're looking at what's going on through his eyes. But don't feel that you failed if you don't constantly have his picture in your forehead. I would also add, and I, I realize this increasingly in my own life, the more you meditate, the more the guru is with you. So I know, we hear, I know the culture here in India, it's a very demanding one. People work many long hours, don't have much free time for anything else. But again, if we want to be a spiritual warrior, we have to cut out, the, carve out, 
in our lives the time to meditate. And if you're regular in your meditation, and those of you who have received Kriya initiation in our practice of Kriya, and if you, I will just take a little pause here. If you haven't received Kriya initiation, I urge you, take the preparation courses and receive Kriya. It accelerates your spiritual practices more than you can imagine. So, you know, the the more we are interiorized, see, because what are moods? What are desires? It's the energy going out to the world, and then it throws us off emotionally or whatever. And then when we meditate, we're interiorizing the energy. And I will also say something that I believe is true. I wouldn't say it if I didn't. But I think, the, by and large, the culture of India, even though it's busy, but there is an ability to interiorize the mind and meditate that is natural in this, in, to most Indians, far more than people in the West. There's a natural ability to interiorize. It's just I don't know. I'm jealous of it, but I I just see it. I see people who begin to meditate and are immediately able to go into a deep state. So do practice meditation regularly, and then you will see little by little that light of the divine consciousness is always with you, and it isn't a mental process. You know, we have friends who used to set their watches to beep every hour to think about Master. That's all fine, but it's it's mental exercises. The real joy comes when the spontaneous awareness of Master's presence is always with you, and that is the fruit of regular meditation. And and think of it, it's not going to happen in a week or in a month. It's a lifetime. Think of, okay, this lifetime, Master, we're going to do it. We're going to just focus on this. and And you will be surprised. How you change. Okay, maybe we have one more question. Swamiji writes that uh, two things cannot be produced artificially self awareness and feeling. Self awareness I can understand. What does he mean by feeling? Well, Master and Swamiji both taught that feeling is the most fundamental aspect of consciousness. So our consciousness has different aspects to it. One is mental reasoning, the ability to perceive and to reason. Another is feeling, and another is will, and finally action. But feeling, Swami used the example of if you can take a little worm and that worm doesn't have a reasoning process to it. But if you poke it, it feels something, and it reacts to that, and it tries to protect itself. But it doesn't reason through, oh, an enemy is something, is, it's just the feeling nature. So the feeling nature, if if you just kind of, it's, it's hard to even rationally state it, but just try to feel the energy, feel the energy in this room right now. If you do, try to feel it without thinking it through and rationalizing, you can feel a certain kind of energy here. And so the feeling nature is one of our means of perceiving. And then because we get it tied up with desires, which is mainly, I like this and I don't like that. When feeling gets tied to desires, then desires, when when you said you get in a mood, it, you get in a mood because you have a desire. And that desire is frustrated. So that desire is a feeling aspect, but it's feeling instead of just perceiving and being at rest, it's feeling committed to a particular goal. And when that commitment to the goal is frustrated, 
then you get in a mood. You get angry or you get upset or you get sad or something, but but then there gets the taint of emotion to it. But feeling in and of itself doesn't have it it isn't the same as a mood. It it's a means of the soul's kind of more subtle perception of the world through feeling. Now I don't know whether that was clear at all or not. But. Okay, well I think we probably need to leave, but we will just close. We're sorry we have to leave. Uh, I, I'm just uh, Sri Kartikeyan. We have a meeting with him, and we we have to go to this. So we're sorry, but we will we will have the satsang tomorrow night without an end. And now uh, we'll, <laughs> well, we won't quite say that. <laughs> And then uh, the Kriya on Saturday and uh, the large program on Sunday. And so there'll be many activities. So um, we just want to say the devotion that you all have built together will draw the grace of the Guru into your lives. And every you will be surprised, really. It's... Um, you know, at first the spiritual path seems like it's just so much do this, do that, do this, do that. Uh, don't do this, don't do that. But but after a while, you just start feeling the grace of God and Guru in your heart. And you realize that all the, the do's and the don'ts are just kind of preliminary training. And the joy and bliss of God is is something that is accessible to all of us. So um, we're just very happy to be with all of you, and we thank you for your beautiful spirit.